Linda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. You're shy. Slides. Yes. <laughs> yes, you do. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you this morning. So what I want to do is talk to you at the start about our view on the Australian economy and, and how it's performing and then go into the budget in uh, some detail and, and what that means, not only for the outlook for fiscal policy, but the outlook for the Australian economy and also what it means uh, for monetary policy. So if we just move through to the first slide, here at CBA, we have been expecting since late 2020, a, a strong recovery in the Australian economy. In fact, I think it's time that we stop saying recovery. We're now just talking about an economic expansion. So on our expectations, the Australian economy reached its pre-COVID level of economic activity over the first quarter of 2021. So you can see that in the red line there, it looks like GDP is back now above the level we saw back in December 2019. So just a bit of background, the Australian economy contracted uh, close to 2.5% in 2020. We're now expecting a pretty strong growth rate of 4.7% in 2021 and then a further 3.7% in 2022. Now, we were actually leading uh, in terms of the growth forecast, but certainly what we've seen in recent weeks is both the Reserve Bank of Australia and now Treasury have come out with pretty big forecasts on growth over the course of the next year or so. And I think that's because we now, for the first time in many, many years, as, as Sean pointed out before, we now have monetary policy and fiscal policy working in the same direction. So this is something that has not happened in the Australian economy for the last decade or so. So we now have fiscal policy taking a much more active role in the management of demand in the Australian economy than we have seen uh, in the, the previous years at a time when monetary policy is still very accommodative, but is really at its limits in terms of what else it can do to help boost the Australian economy. So just some strong points and what's driving our optimistic view of the Australian economy at the moment is certainly the control of COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout. So while there's obviously been challenges with the vaccine rollout, we do think that that's obviously meant the Australian economy can remain open compared to other economies around the world. And certainly the control of that and the success we've had at that has certainly boosted the outlook for the Australian economy. It's also the number one risk still. And, and we've obviously seen that in recent weeks with some outbreaks come through. Uh, but certainly the management of that in Australia has, has meant our, Australia, our economy has continued to perform much better than what we've seen in other countries around the world. With our better control of COVID and with the very generous income support that we saw from the federal government over the past year, we've seen household income growth remain very strong. We've seen a lot of that money being saved rather than spent so that has fueled a sharp lift in consumer confidence. So some measures out there at the moment, including the Westpac Melbourne Institute survey has consumer sentiment levels at decade highs. So consumers are feeling confident. That's really being driven by a very strong labor market and also fueled by the strong lift in house prices we've seen uh, over recent months as well. So the wealth effect is coming through to help boost consumer spending and confidence at the moment. Other key drivers, we've obviously seen domestic tourism rebound. We've got a very strong uh, mining export sector at the moment, particularly that iron ore price. So iron ore prices currently at US $230 a tonne are just enormous. And obviously when we talk about the budget bottom line, that strong lift in iron ore prices has been one of the key drivers of where that government revenue has come from as well. We also see at the moment still a very strong public sector infrastructure program led by both the federal and state governments. So as Sean said, we've seen the federal government, but also state governments as well, really change tack in the view of debt. Uh, we used to have a discussion here in Australia that debt was bad. That's now really changed. So governments are using the very low interest rates that we have to borrow 
and to fund some really great programs in terms of the infrastructure space. So we expect that to continue to lead to growth uh, in the Australian economy over the next couple of years. So we do expect, similar to the federal government and the RBA as well, unemployment to fall to 5% by year end. It's currently at 5.6% and then 4.7% by the end of 2022. Now, one of the biggest X factors at the moment, I think, is the Australian economy kind of next year. So for me, 2021 is largely baked in. 22, 2022 gets a little bit more interesting, particularly when we start to talk about the reopening of borders, which I'll touch on soon. But if you move on to the next slide, let's get into some of the nitty gritty details about the budget. So on Tuesday night, uh, oh, these are just uh, the, the forecasts. I might just skip through that because I have spent some time. So effectively, the, the forecasts contained in the budget look fine to us. So we usually spend a lot of time looking at the economic forecasts in the budget with a fine tooth comb just to make sure that they're not either too optimistic or too pessimistic. But this time around, uh, they certainly have forecast pretty reasonable growth, very similar to ours. They're probably a little bit too pessimistic on wages and inflation growth, similar to the RBA. Uh, so we do think there's more upside risk to wages and inflation just because we have the labour market improving rapidly and with borders closed, you will start to see skill shortages uh, come through earlier than what we think the government is expecting and wages growth to lift. But just on those budget numbers, and I, I'm going to be honest, we were surprised about the size of the deficit in 21-22. So when those numbers hit our screen at 7.30 on Tuesday night, we really had to look at that budget deficit number, I reckon, three times for 2021. So leading into it, uh, we actually had the budget deficit at around $78 billion came in at 106.6 billion. So that was a big surprise for us. Uh, so there has been a big improvement in the budget bottom line from 2020, 2021. So the budget came in at 161 billion. Uh, Apologise if you can hear the plane coming over me at the moment, that's all those domestic tourists flying uh, around. So the budget deficit improved from 106 billion in 2020, 2021. And then the budget deficit will be around 106 billion in 21-22. Over the over the next four years, as you can see in the top chart on the right, there's only a very slow improvement in the in the budget bottom line. So in 24-25, the budget deficit falls to only 57 billion. So there's actually only a very slow improvement coming through. So if you look at the bottom chart. What we put there is a tax and so revenue and spending share of GDP. So you can see at the moment, the spending share of GDP lifted enormously uh, during the COVID-19 recession, uh, got up to around 33% of GDP. It's only gonna fall very slowly. So the spending initiatives that have been put in place have been putting the budget for longer than what we expected and revenue remains constrained. So there is, I guess, this jaw happening where spending initiatives are there, revenue is not coming back, and that means the budget deficit remains larger for longer than what most people expect. So if we move on to the next slide, as I said, one of the things that really surprised us in the budget was just how much money they spent because the economy was improving. So in 21-22, the stronger economy, so that's a better improving labour market, they've had to pay out less job keeper, less job seeker. So they saved around $27 billion worth there. They spent around $21 billion worth on other spending initiatives. Instead of banking that money, they spent it. So, and they continue to do that over 2022-23 and 23, 24. So the government is actually spending more money than the revenue that they're saving from the improvement in the economy. So as I said, and that's the yellow lines that I've highlighted there. So they're certainly taking 
this excuse or not excuse this change in mantra about where they want that unemployment rate to get to to do some very targeted spending measures on sectors that have probably been underfunded for years and that's like uh, aged care mental health child care they've certainly used this change in philosophy to go out there and spend uh, on those particular sectors so if you move on uh, to the next slide uh, that has all had consequences for uh, Australia's debt as well. So we look at Australia's net debt. So it's going to rise from around 617 billion as at June this year to close to a trillion dollars uh, as at June 2025. So that's a very strong lift in Australia's debt position. Some of you may remember that we were actually in a net asset position uh, in the early 2000s. So if you look at the chart, the blue line there, Australia actually had no debt back in uh, around 2002, 2003. And there was a lot of discussions back then about closing down effectively Australia's bond program. Um, thankfully we didn't, because there's now going to be a significant amount of government bonds uh, on issue. Uh, so they did well uh, not to do that. But you can see that net debt does rise quite significantly. So there are some concerns out there uh, that Australia may well finally lose its AAA credit rating. So that's one thing that we're looking at quite closely over the next few months, uh, because on a lot of metrics, we don't stack up to be AAA anymore. So we may well see that credit rating be downgraded. One of the really interesting things though, and certainly Sean touched on this as well, is Australia's interest payments or the, the cost of its debt actually doesn't move that much. So the red line is showing you public debt interest. So the cost of servicing that debt as a percentage of GDP. And that really just stays at 0.7% out to uh, 24, 25. So where it has been since around two, 2013, because of those low interest rates that we've seen globally, we have to remember Australia is really a price taker, global interest rates, the cost of servicing that debt remains the same. So Australia's debt repayments remain very manageable. And certainly our view is the economic benefits of that increasing debt far, out see, far outweigh at the cost of that interest. There is some concern though, that obviously if we do lose our AAA credit rating, we may see interest rates lift. If it happens, it will only be very marginal at best. So I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about some of the programs. Move on to the next slide. So certainly uh, some of the key budget initiatives uh, at the moment, uh, aged care obviously, significant funding, same as the NDIS and mental health. So a lot of focus on the health side of the budget, although differently to hospitals or those programs, it is really to the heart of where I think the problems have been. There's certainly been a focus on uh, workforce participation. So both through childcare, the extra $1.7 billion worth is aimed at getting more females in back in employment for more days during the week. Uh, for those of you who've ever had children in childcare, it is extremely expensive and hard to find. I'm in my last year of, of childcare and I can't wait uh, for next year. Uh, so unfortunately I don't benefit from um, these changes because they come into effect uh, next year. But certainly there's been a big push through childcare and job training to get more people into the workforce. We remember what drives economic growth, it's productivity growth, population growth and participation. So they're really focused on elements of that in today's budget. Focused on uh, continuing the income growth in the Australian economy and for the consumer. So the extension of the low middle income tax offset will obviously help drive uh, con consumption in 2021 been changes on housing as well so getting more people the ability to buy a house um, particularly from lower socio-economic uh, population uh, if we move on to the next slide um, some of the other big programs have been on infrastructure so just lifting 
the amount of infrastructure spend over the next decade. One thing that really surprised us was the extension uh, of the business tax incentive. So the temporary full expensing of investment has been extended and the temporary loss carry provision. That was a big uh, spending initiative in the budget. It will lift business investment. So we did start to see business in 20 and we should see that continue to lift in 2021. Business investment generally lags the economic cycle. It was very weak pre-COVID-19. So some of these measures should certainly see uh, that boost come through over the next couple of years at a time, once again, when businesses have also stockpiled a lot of cash, same as households, they certainly have the funding there to go out there and, and do that investment if they feel the economic outlook warrants it, uh, which at the moment, it really does suggest that that is in place. Just moving on to the next slide. Uh, some others, obviously, uh, education, higher education, apologies to all those on the line, did miss out. There was the clear focus on apprenticeships, preschool, uh, rather than the higher education sector. And once again, just for the government trying to fix some of the issues they have around women, they've scrapped the minimum $450 income earned before you now get paid on superannuation. So certainly a lot of spending initiatives uh, to target particular problem areas that have been in place in the Australian, gov in the Australian government uh, over recent years, but it is a budget to obviously go out there, support economic growth, to support bringing the unemployment rate back down to pre-pandemic levels, so well below 5%. We do think that combined with the fiscal policy expansion, as well as a very low interest rate set by the RBA, we may actually see wages growth and inflation come through earlier than what the Reserve Bank of Australia and the government are currently expecting. And it could well test the RBA's mantra of interest rates not rising until 2024 at the earliest, we do think that they may have to bring some of those changes forward into 2023. I will leave it there. I did see some questions start coming uh, through the chat. So I'll hand back to you, Rob. Thank you.